Okay, good. So this is the fifth SEC class. Welcome tonight. Uh, tonight's topic, as you can see, is Jesus with the people. Jesus taught the people. Okay? So one thing that's quite clear about Jesus' ministry is that he was constantly out and amongst the people. He did not set up an office or a booth and hang a sign saying, Messiah is in. <laughs> so you're among the peanuts. Uh, he didn't have office hours because he was seemingly always with people. So in Matthew 4, verse 23, it says, Jesus went everywhere in Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news about the kingdom of heaven and healing all the people's diseases and sicknesses. So this passage shows us that Jesus went, as it, in bold there, in yellow, highlighted everywhere, in Galilee, preaching, teaching, and healing. Now, Galilee is about 2,000 square miles. Massachusetts, comparatively, is about 10,500. So, Massachusetts is about five times larger than the area that Jesus walked around in. But either way, 2,000 square miles is a lot of miles to cover when you don't have a car <laughs> or any other kind of transportation. You're using your feet mostly, right? So it's obvious that if we want to help people know God, we must be out and amongst the people too, just like Jesus. And I think I'm really grateful that we have cars and all the other technology that we have that, that assists us in doing that. But it still can be challenging for many of us. I know it was for me, especially earlier in my walk as a disciple of Jesus, to be always out with people. But even today, there are people that are in situations uh, that can make me feel intimidated and maybe sometimes prefer to be alone. Because naturally, I'm a, I'm a shy person, I'm a more reserved person, and God has been working on my character pretty much daily for the last 40 plus years as I pray to him as I read and study his word and work on living out my faith. So when we look at Jesus' life and ministry, we can't help but notice that he was all about other people. Therefore, as his disciples, we must imitate this aspect of his life. Also from this passage, when Jesus was out and amongst the people, one of the things he did was teach. And there are numerous passages that show this. Here are just a few. So in Mark chapter 10, verse 1, again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. So Jesus had a habit or a custom of teaching the many people who came to him. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 54, coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. Jesus' teaching was amazing. In Matthew 26, verse 55, In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day, I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. So teaching was a daily routine or ritual for Jesus. So what does this mean for us? Uh, let's look at Matthew 28, a passage we're all very familiar with, verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So here, Jesus tells the eleven to go and make disciples and to baptize them. But this is where we tend to stop reading. A lot of times we don't take it a 
as far as it says here. Because Jesus tells them to teach the baptized disciples everything he commanded. Well, what did he just teach them? To go and make disciples, to baptize them and teach them. So what does this mean for us? It means once we become a disciple of Jesus, we too are to go make disciples, baptize and teach them all the teachings of Jesus. So Jesus also calls all of us to teach on some level. What can we learn about teaching others from Jesus? Tonight we'll look at just a few things about Jesus' teaching and see what we can learn from the greatest teacher ever. So the first point is Jesus taught with authority. So let's read Matthew 7, 28 and 29. When Jesus finished saying these things, the people were amazed at his teaching because he did not teach like their teachers of the law. He taught like a person who had authority. And we already just saw another passage in, in um, Mark 4 like this tonight. But I don't know about you, I've noticed many verses like this as we've been reading through the Gospels together this summer and fall. Amazement at Jesus' authority and teaching is a reoccurring theme in the Gospels. So you might be thinking, of course he taught with authority. After all, he was the Son of God. But that's not who I am. And I've only been around, I don't know, you fill in the blank, so many months, so many years. So let's look back at Matthew 28, 16 through 20. This time, I'm just going to read the highlighted uh, words, okay? Because I just read the whole scripture through, so I'll just read the highlighted to, to make this next point here. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go, make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So here, Jesus is saying that he has been given all authority, which is obviously from God. This fact is followed by the word therefore, and that links it with what Jesus says next, which is a command to go make disciples, to baptize them, and teach them everything. Jesus is passing the baton to the next runners, his apostles, and also to us who are far off, since his words still apply today. He is authorizing us to carry on his mission. The word authorize means to give official permission or approval. So although we're not the authority, we have his marching orders. So Jesus also calls each of us to teach. Maybe you won't be standing up teaching the region, like I am today, but maybe someday you will be. I know I never thought I would be when I was converted in college or in graduate school. Certainly, we can help others know more about God by studying the Bible with them one-on-one. -on -one. That's obviously a less intimidating situation as I stand up here and shake in my boots. <laughs> we can also teach children, and as parents, we're told to do so. We can teach the people we're around by our words and example, and we're gonna talk more about this later tonight. And hopefully, we're looking to the authority of the Bible for what we say and how we live. Also, in John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Here again, Jesus says that those of us who have faith in Jesus will do the works he did, and that does include teaching. He expects us to teach others, and to pray to God in his name about the works of God that we're doing. It's very encouraging to know that he promises 
that he will answer our prayers and work in a great way through us. Maybe you don't feel equipped to do such works. Maybe there are things that you don't even fully understand yet, never mind be able to help and teach others. Maybe you're not confident and you don't think that you know enough. And maybe that's even true. But let me help you out here. None of us will ever understand everything that's in God's word or about God. Hopefully when we see him in person, we will. <laughs> but not here on this earth. Here are the things that we do have. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We have the very words of God that we can read and listen to, and we can share what we're learning from them with those around us who will listen. The power to change lives does not come from our words, but from God's word, and the working of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so important to get our friends who don't know God yet reading the Bible on their own and into studies with disciples that can help them understand it. We also have available to us a basic study series that has helped many people over the last few decades from many different places learn the foundational truths of God's word. And it sounds like our leaders have been working on this and revising it, the, the, the study series, and that we'll be learning what they've come up with very soon. Thankfully, we have older brothers and sisters who often know more and are ready to help. As disciples of Jesus, they want to live out Jesus' great commission. And I was just thinking about this today because I'm like, okay, I'm in my 60s. And I guess there's a few disciples around in their 70s and 80s who can help. But as you get older, you become the people that people are coming to. So anyways, it's kind of a funny thing. But, but we do have one another. That's right. Um, let's see here. Where did I lost my place? And just in case we don't know, if you don't know something, we have amazing resources at our fingertips, mm -hmm. more than ever before in this age of technology. But the teacher in me does want to warn you and remind you to always check your sources. Not everything out there on the internet is correct. That's for sure. It's even okay to say, let me look it up and I'll get back to you on that when you're not sure. It's fine. We don't know everything, and we're not supposed to know everything. Most of all, we have Jesus' blessing to go teach others. This is what he wants us to do. His plan since he left has been to use ordinary people to teach others the good news on how to be right with God, and he has left us thoroughly equipped. That's point number one. Point number two, Jesus taught by telling stories. So let's look at Mark 4, verses 1 and 2. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen. Then further down in Mark 4, verses 33 and 34, it says, with many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. As many of you already know, a parable is a simple earthly story used to illustrate a spiritual or moral truth. There is debate about the exact number of parables that Jesus told. The number varies with the exact definition of what a parable is. Generally, though, there are believed to be about 43 parables, and all the parables are in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are called the Synoptic Gospels because of their similarity to one another. John's Gospel is a little bit different from those three, and it really contains no parables. Some parables are a couple of sentences, other parables are paragraphs long. 
Jesus used these to teach because the people could relate and connect to the everyday circumstances that Jesus used to tell them. The meanings aren't immediately obvious, and that's intentional. True seekers need to think on, ponder, meditate, and ruminate over these parables to figure them out. Those that dig in will end up understanding. So in Matthew 7, it says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Also, stories are often easier to remember, and everyone loves to listen to them. My academic background is in science, which is full of facts and figures. I'm retired now, but for almost 20 years, I taught biology, chemistry, anatomy, and physiology to high school students. By far, the students preferred to hear the stories and not the facts. <laughs> They loved my story about the time I needed to use the safety shower when I was working for a pharmaceutical company, and the tubing that was cleaning the equipment I was using burst off and sprayed me with acid, and about various other lab mishaps that I recounted so they could learn from my mistakes. <laughs> now, I'm not much of a storyteller, and maybe that's why I ended up teaching science and not English. <laughs> but we all have a story. I heard it said that we are all miracles, and in fact, Hugo said that on Sunday in our sector service. And so, we all have our miracle story to tell about how Jesus rescued us from the darkness of our sin. Many of you have already heard mine, but I do love to share how God brought me out of New York to Boston, a place where our church and this movement were growing in the early 1980s, by presenting me with a full scholarship to do my graduate work at Boston University. I could never have afforded to come here otherwise. I was raised by a single mom, and she insisted that my sisters and I attend college, but we couldn't help, she couldn't help pay for it. And God offered me this scholarship at just the right time in my life when I was feeling trapped in my sin, and I was questioning the CCD lessons, which stands for confraternity of Christian doctrine that I was teaching to third grade public school students as a volunteer at my church. Wow. I was searching for spiritual answers, so I had bought myself a Bible and started to read from the first book of Genesis, and I was stuck somewhere in Leviticus, <laughs> getting more confused than questions answered. <laughs> but he put me with people from our church who could and desired to help me get to know God. Amen. Back then, there were no cell phones or social media, etc. You answered ads, and I found a place to live by answering an ad on a bulletin board at Boston University. I remember my mother and I standing in front of that bulletin board looking at all these ads. We should pick that one, you know? <laughs> but it turned out that one of my roommates was friends with a medical student, Dave Traver, who was a member of our church. In addition to all this, these disciples met for Bible study right across the street from my apartment in Cleveland Circle. Wow. How convenient for a busy graduate student. God is incredible, and we all have our own miracle story to prove it. And we have other miracle stories Two, of how God is answering our prayers and working in our lives. For example, this is a funny one that happened last year. Kevin and I live in a 55 plus condominium association now, and we're some of the youngest people that live there, but most of the men are retired and they play golf weekly in a league. They invited Kevin to play in a tournament at the end of last summer, and since he's athletic, and likes challenges, he accepted, even though he only played once or twice that year. <laughs> the night before the tournament, Kevin was having second thoughts about this due to his lack of experience. <laughs> I encouraged him, I said, just go and have fun, and I, and I prayed about it that next morning, asking God to encourage my husband at this event. And boy, did God answer that prayer. 
Kevin ended up taking first place in the tournament. <laughs> His name is even engraved on a plaque in the clubhouse. <laughs> on top of that, there was a raffle, and he won the top prize, which was a round of golf for two at the country club. And all the, the other kind of people were joking. They, they were calling it the Kevin Manning Invitational. <laughs> but in my mind, God encouraged my husband like I asked him to do. And that was so encouraging to me. Yes. Also this year, our daughter Andrea got married and we were hosting a welcome rehearsal party at our house the night before. Now our condo is smaller uh, than the home that we raised our kids in, so I was a bit concerned with where I would put 35 people if it rained. Mm. So I prayed and I begged God for good weather that weekend, even though all summer it was raining on most of the weekends, so that we could spread out into the backyard. And he answered in his usual big God fashion. Labor Day weekend was only the second weekend of the summer when all the days wow. were rain free and completely beautiful. Yeah. Sunny and in the 70s. In fact, the whole week was gorgeous for our out-of-town guests. And God kept reminding me of his faithfulness and how he answered that prayer, especially for me through September and October, as the weekends were often partly rainy as well. Wow. One more. I couldn't figure out which one of these to, to leave out, so I'm going to just throw them all in. I do have time. Okay, don't worry. Then there was a time in my son's senior year in high school that I prayed for him to be able to somehow make the mass state men's gymnastics meet, which was scheduled for the same day as a club meet that he had in Las Vegas. He worked so hard that year, and it would be his last, and he wanted to be at both so much. I went to God with a mother's request to work this out for my son, and he did. God sent a snowstorm that rescheduled the state meet which he attended the week after the club meet, so Brian got to do both. And he also placed first in the state that year. Wow. And he broke several records, too. The Mannings were all very thankful and pleased about the way things turned out. But I could go on and on. There are so many stories like this where God answers over yes. and above what we ask. Yes. Just think about your own answered prayers. Or you might be saying, well, that doesn't happen to me. Remember, the scripture that's up there says it, that God promises we will receive if we ask. So are you asking and persisting and believing God will work? Mm -hmm. Just some practical, something practical here. A prayer journal is a useful tool that helps me to remember what I've asked in my prayers because it's written down. I don't always write my prayers down, but my memory is getting worse with age, and we have such full lives as disciples that it's helpful to do so. I'm always amazed when I read back through the journal and see how God has moved. Also, lately, I've been sharing with the lost such stories about the way God is answering my prayers, and I think it's a powerful way to testify to our great God and to share our connection with him. Yes. I'm currently studying the Bible with an 87-year-old woman at the Independent Living Home in my town. We've been studying for a couple of years now. Not long ago, I asked her a question. I can't even actually remember what the question was. It was during one of our studies. But her response was, I want to get to know your God, with the emphasis on the word your. We can proclaim his name and praise and honor God with our stories about how he's working in our lives and in the lives of those around us in our church family. All right. Everybody with me? Yes. I'm going on to point number three here. All right. Jesus taught by asking questions. And Jesus asked a lot of questions. Who remembers Carrie's um, second SEC class? on uh, conversations of Jesus. Some of you guys are raising your hands, good. She did a great job, is she here tonight? I don't think I saw her. Oh, she's always back, hey Carrie. Awesome. Anybody remember how many questions Jesus asked, or about how many? 300. Oh, great, 307 is more specifically, but very good. Anybody remember how many questions were asked of Jesus? 
Good. What is your background spiritually? Did someone else have their hand up? Did Lisa? Do you read the Bible? Do you read the Bible? Good. The good one. I'm sure I don't know your, I don't remember your name. Valerie. Good. Valerie. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, are they interested in spiritual things? Are they a spiritual person? Did you have one too? I had the same one. Are, are you interested in spiritual things? Tell me about your spiritual background. Good, those are great questions. So some of my favorite, I put them down here. Basic, do you read the Bible? Are you in interested in learning about what the Bible says? Do you go somewhere to worship God or where do you go to worship God? Lately I have been really liking being able to tell people or um, explain to people how God and the Bible have changed my life, and that's because he has. You guys wouldn't recognize me as the same person I was 40 years ago. Now don't get me wrong, engaging people in spiritual conversations on any level is great, but I have found that I personally need to go deeper than just inviting people to a church service or a Bible study. Let's try to engage people in conversations that will help them come to some spiritual conclusions about their hearts and souls as Jesus did. All right, last point here. Point number four, Jesus practiced what he preached. One example we see in John 13, verses 13 through 17. It says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So Jesus got down into the dirty situation situations with others. He clearly demonstrates that here when he washes the stinky, dirty feet of his best friends. And he expects us to do the same as his disciples. You can see the highlighted words up there. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. If we profess to be his disciples, we too must live out what we preach. We must demonstrate integrity in this way. And since we're not perfect, we must also demonstrate humility when we mess up. Of course, Jesus takes this to a whole other level at the cross. In 1 Peter 2, verses 21 through 25, it says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Here we see Jesus giving up all, everything, even his own life, his very life. He loved his enemies, and he trusted God even when it was the hardest. He could have put them in their place, all of them, but he remained silent, and he loved us enough to die for us. Jesus hated hypocrisy, and he demonstrated the opposite of this in his life and in his death. He was the ultimate example and teacher. How are you doing with your example? I believe that our example is especially important as we study the Bible with those not yet in a right relationship with God and teach them how to be true disciples. Are you spending time with God daily and putting God first in your life, your choices, your schedule, and on and on. Are you making his kingdom a priority in, in your life and participating in the meetings of the body and the fellowship? Are you about the mission of Christ to seek 
and bring back his lost sheep to him? Are you taking time to reach out and love others enough to serve them and sit with them to teach them God's word? Where are our hearts on these matters? Hopefully, we're joyfully obeying and responding to Jesus and God and living in a way that is pleasing to them. And if not, there's always repentance because we'll all be always doing that for the rest of our lives. So as we finish up tonight, in summary, Jesus taught with authority from God and he authorizes us to go spread the gospel to all nations and teach others. He told stories or parables and asked many questions. He taught by example and he is the greatest teacher to have ever lived. His words are still being shared thousands of years after he left the earth and they're still changing lives. This room is a testimony to that. I hope that you've been encouraged tonight and that you've learned something to help you as you strive to follow Jesus. I'd like to leave you with one last thing to think and pray about. And that is, who can I teach or share the scriptures with? For you, it might be a family member, your children, maybe your grandchildren, a neighbor, a co-worker, etc. Or you may be able to get into a study with someone in your family group, with a new friend that's seeking. Let's all pray and think about how we can imitate Jesus in teaching others God's word. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the fellowship tonight.